So at your repair shop, what was brought in? What was requested? What was the what was the you know ordinary assignment? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, April twelfth, twenty nineteen. Uh, client came in with three liquid damage laptops, and uh, you know, wanted me to get the data off of them. And what work did you do at that point when you still thought you know this is an ordinary repair? How far along did you get? Well, uh, with data recovery, it was it was kind of one of those scenarios where. Um, you know, he, he presented me with three machines. He wanted the data off of all three. I knew that I didn't want to check in three machines at $85 each. So I sat with the customer to kind of go through the three machines to kind of see which ones were potential for data recovery, which ones were write-offs, because all three were liquid damage. Uh, one of them was uh, beyond salvageability. Uh, the drive soldered to the logic board. And if I can't get any voltage to the logic board, we're never going to get anything off the data. So I returned that one to, to Hunter. Then I, um, uh, the second one had just a couple inoperable keys on the keyboard. So I ended up uh, just giving him a keyboard to allow him to access the drive when he was able to gain access. I said, here, hold on to the keyboard. When you come back in to pick everything up, you can drop off the keyboard. This way he could facilitate his own data recovery and I wouldn't have to check it in. I wouldn't have to do the work and I wouldn't have to bill them. Uh, the third machine uh, was getting power, but was not able to boot. Uh, it was it did show potential for data recovery. So I explained to him the procedure. I would recover the data to the store server, contact him when the recovery is complete, let him know what size drive he would need to come and drop off, and then he could drop that off. Uh, so that process was explained. And uh, the machine, the one machine that I could recover data off of was collected. Uh, he left. I went into the back to start the recovery, uh, thinking that everything would be automated and just go overnight. Um, I, I, I left the shop and I came back in the next day to realize that the power issues were a lot worse than I anticipated and the machine was not able to charge. So it was shutting down. So then I had to manually recover the data where I would charge up the machine, drag and drop folders and files until the battery would die. And then I'd have to unplug everything, charge the battery back up go through the process again. This process went throughout the day uh, until I was able to uh, recover majority of the requested user data or actually all of the user data. So, and that was, no. uh, that was a process. What point did you notice something notable on, on those drives? Well, um, the next day, because when the a hard drive had, or when the machine had failed overnight, I had to boot it up, kind of compare what was able to be copied from the, the laptop to the server. And in that comparison process, when I'm going by folder by folder to see where the, the data transfer tourniqueted and I'm going to have to pick it up again, that's when I realized uh, that there was a lot of uh, sensitive and embarrassing material on the laptop. Also some questionable criminality as well. So I, I was concerned. What sort of stuff did you see specifically that that raised alarms for you? Um. Well, a lot of a lot of personal stuff, um, sensitive stuff that nobody would want out. Um, also, some financial documents, um, a lot of money being exchanged. Uh, so that kind of it really wasn't that big of a concern uh, for me. It was just kind of uh, this is disgusting. This is gross. And this is, uh, you know. Questionable. Uh, but my, you know, it was just a job. And uh, I think it was a couple of weeks later is when his father announced his candidacy that I started to get concerned because he was in a possession of a document that said I was allowed to go through and recover data from these devices. And I just figured it was a matter of time before somebody would figure out that I had seen what I seen and I was in possession of what I was in possession of. So I was I started to get concerned. Had anything like that happened before in your job where you'd been working on a computer and discovered something that was concerning or questionable to you? Uh, there was a couple of times at Apple um, that the situation came up and, and we had to bring in the authorities. Yeah. And so what do you normally do in a situation like that? Uh, you know, you're working on someone's personal device and you find something that you think authorities need to be aware of. You contact the authorities. And and how did you do that in this case? Um, at what point in the process did you reach out? Who did you reach out to? Well, uh, 
I first, the first person I reached out to was my father, um, uh, who's a retired Colonel in the air force. Um, I, I, by the mid to late summer, I was getting concerned for my safety and I knew I needed to get this to the authorities. I was really, really concerned about local politics, local law enforcement loyalties to the Biden family in this area. So I enlisted my father uh, to reach out to the FBI in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, which he did in um, October, I think, 9th of 2019. And I I, I want to, if yeah. I may, I, I want to say that, that, you know, one of the things that I think um, people don't realize is that if Hunter had come back to pick up his laptop, um, John Paul wouldn't have been, sure, he saw some questionable things on there, but he wouldn't have been concerned. Um, he His concern arose just by being in possession of this information and uh, the fact that Hunter knew he had it and uh, and the Biden campaign, the concern was that the Biden campaign would want that information back. And um, so it, if Hunter had just come back to pick it up, it wouldn't have been a concern at all. Right. That was actually going to be another question that I had. Thank you for thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah. At what point? Because I remember reading that, you know, you had sent him some invoices and some notices saying, hey, come pick up your device. So did just to get the timeline straight, did you send him those notices first or did you reach out to your dad to contact the FBI first? Oh, I I, I didn't reach out to my father until September of 2019. Uh, I made efforts to get a hold of Hunter starting uh, on the 16th, I believe, or 15th of uh, April to say, come in and drop off an external hard drive so I can put your stuff back on, which he did on the 16th. So he came back into the shop on the 16th, dropped off the two terabyte uh, Western Digital external hard drive, uh, I believe purchased at Best Buy, um, and I transferred everything back. He also at that time requested that I send him a uh, Square secure payment through the credit card processing Square. And uh, which I told him I would call him and and send that payment in the morning when the transfer was complete, which I did. Uh, that's an automatic payment request. So when it became defunct, I'm sure he got email notifications for a while from Square that you have an outstanding bill. Also, the uh, I made several attempts after that to get a hold of him. Um, I believe at the end of that week, and then definitely at the end of the month, and uh, probably one or two times after that. And. You mentioned that um, when he dropped off the device and when you drop off any device, usually there's some sort of period of time after which it's considered abandoned. Mm -hmm. 90 days. And so ordinarily, if a device is abandoned, what do you do with it? Well, if it's a, if it's a repair, um, then any parts that were used in that repair get returned back into inventory. Uh, if the uh, machine has any salvageable parts. I, I typically, back when I had a business, uh, I didn't like to use parts that didn't have a warranty. So in a case like uh, an abandoned machine, if a customer came in and they needed a hinge, I would say, hey, look, I have an abandoned machine in the back that has that hinge. I'll charge you the labor. You can have the hinge. So I would I would chop up the machine into pieces and try to salvage as much as I could off of the repair. Unfortunately, this wasn't a repair. This was a, a data recovery from a liquid damage machine. So there was no parts that were put into it. There was just my time. And unfortunately, because it was a liquid damage machine and the way Apple constructs these products, there's not a single salvageable component. I can't use the display, it had some liquid damage. The keyboard had liquid damage. Uh, and there was nothing on the machine that could be salvaged. So it was just a complete write-off. Um. And so in this case, you would ordinarily probably just throw it away. Um, yeah, I mean, this, th there's some case value. So like the bottom case, if somebody had a foot that fell off or something. So I probably like I had a recycling bin, basically, that would be the purgatory, if you will, between hardware's permanent Viking funeral and, and something where there might be hope. Gotcha. Um, and but in this case. You obviously didn't do that. You you kept it um, for a while because I'm assuming of the things you had seen on there. So what 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 was that decision like when you're like, this is not an ordinary repair. This is something that I need to keep around. 
So when the product, uh, when the laptop became my property in uh, mid July, uh, I about the same time in the news cycle, I was hearing discussions about congressional investigations and the Burisma. And I remember specifically seeing a document that I had been uh, verifying data when I was doing the transfer uh, that it, it was a PDF document labeled income PDF. And I remember seeing Burisma and how there was $2.4 million that they weren't going to report. And I'm like this, it just threw up all these red flags. So I made a decision that, you know, this is something that I don't, this is a, this is a time bomb. I don't want to sit on it, but before I go and stick my neck out and go to the authorities, I just want to make sure what I saw was real. Cause we're talking, this was like three months ago. So I did a deep dive into the laptop and, uh, about late July and into August. And it didn't take me but a couple of weeks to, to see a level of what I perceived as criminality on the laptop, ranging beyond just sex and drugs and, and whatnot. So uh, I, I knew that I had to get into the authorities. I just didn't know how. So I made that determination in August from the additional content that I had viewed after the, the laptop became my property. And so then after your father reached out to the FBI in New Mexico, what happened next? How long did it take before you heard from them? Well, my father walked into the field office in Albuquerque. Um, he has since described it as the most uh, humiliating moment of his life. Uh, he's a 31 year decorated war vet, and he goes in to the FBI field office, basically seeking help for his son that's 1600 miles away. And the FBI agent refused to give his name uh kind of chastised my father for not completing certain fields on the document uh the the FBI form because my father didn't know who was going to see this form he didn't want to be like my son sitting on so and so's laptop so uh the the FBI interaction with my father the 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 FBI questioned the authenticity or the le legality of how I acquired it he said he told my father to lawyer up and get out of his office uh, my father tried to give a copy of the laptop to the FBI agent. The FBI agent refused, but the FBI agent did want a copy of the paperwork, uh, the signed authorization. So uh, that was pretty much it. We didn't hear back from the FBI until uh, November 1st when uh, the FBI, an FBI agent named Joshua Wilson uh, reached out to my father in an effort to get a hold of me. Uh, my father communicated through uh, email and voice with him. Uh, and CC, blind CC'd me so I could kind of get a feel for this guy. And then when I said it was okay for him to reach out to me, my father passed on that contact information and uh, uh, Joshua reached out to me probably first week in November, uh, requesting to sit down and just talk with me. Uh, I agreed. And then two agents in mid-November came into my home. Uh, I had printed up what I had thought was uh, documents that I felt were topical uh, to what I felt was my concerns, but also because during this time, uh, cause now we're talking mid November, uh, the impeachment hearings were taking place and I was concerned, um, impeachment is a very embarrassing thing for a nation to go through. And I think that's why we've had so few of them, but I, I didn't like the fact that it was being weaponized over something that from what I had seen on that laptop was a justifiable phone call. So I, I knew I wanted to kind of at least, I felt like this laptop needed to be in the hands of the authorities so that there could at least be some defense to in the impeachment hearings. Um, so I printed up some information that I felt would be related to that and also Burisma um, and my concerns. I tried to give it to the FBI agents. They ignored it. Um, they basically asked me first if there was any child porn that I had seen on the computer. I said, I saw a lot of porn, but... I, I I wasn't checking cards or ages. Uh, plus, it's gross and it's not something I'd look at. Um, I then expressed my, they asked me what my concerns were, and I expressed my concerns for my safety, uh, both from individuals foreign and domestic that would want to do me harm for what I had seen on this laptop. Uh, they asked me who those people were, and I told them who. Um, and then I asked them, uh, you know, I just, I just want the laptop out of my shop and I want a phone number I can call should somebody come looking for it or come anybody come hassling me or uh, basically an emergency line that I could call if something should happen. And uh, they said they couldn't take it. They'd have to talk to the legal team, uh, but they'd get back to me. And then a uh, couple, 
uh, about maybe two weeks later, right before, right, maybe early December, uh, they wanted, they said that they wanted to bring a uh, tech guy to my shop to make a forensic copy of the laptop. And I kind of scratched my head because I knew the condition of the machine. So I knew that they were going to be hard pressed to do a forensic lack, uh, copy, but I figured the FBI can afford better techs than me. So uh, sure, come on in. Uh, we agreed that they would come in on December 9th um, of 2019. And uh, I met them at the shop. Uh, there was the only two agents, Agent Mike and Agent Joshua, and uh, no tech guy. And they said, uh, they came in and they said, yeah, we're just going to take everything. Here's a subpoena. And I was like, that's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled. And they kind of looked at me like I had two heads because I don't think anybody has ever been so excited to be handed a subpoena. And so they they were like, yeah, we want the paperwork, we want the drive, and we want the laptop. And I'm like, great, here you go. Uh, that morning, it kind of seemed odd because Agent Mike had called me up and he had requested the actual serial numbers off of the devices. And then when he showed up, the subpoena said that I had to show up before a grand jury. And then it said, in lieu of attendance, uh, see Appendix A. And Appendix A was a plain white sheet of paper with just like the subpoena code at the top. And then it had like the laptop serial number and the Western digital serial number on it. And that, that was kind of, I think the first red flag. Cause, cause I was like, why, why would this, this, this seems like he just threw this on this piece of paper. This piece of paper could be switched out with any piece of paper ever. And, and so that kind of threw up a red flag. And then uh, I cracked the joke when they were leaving where I was like, don't worry, lads, when I write the book, I'll leave your names out. Uh, that's when Agent Mike turned around and told me that in his, in his experience, nothing ever happens to people that don't talk about these things. And that took a little bit to digest, but by the, you know, then he, then actually Major, Agent Mike called me up about a couple hours later because they were having trouble accessing the drive. And then I explained to them that it's a Mac formatted drive and you're going to need a Mac to, to access it. So then they called me up a couple hours later because they were having trouble. They didn't know what type of charger to get because I guess they wanted to try to power up the laptop. And I, this went on, I think, for a day or two. Uh, but I figured by this point, if I wasn't cooperating with the FBI, uh, then I could get in trouble if I wasn't you know, helping them. So uh, didn't hear back from them for a week or so. And then about maybe a week, maybe a week before Christmas, Agent Mike called me and asked if uh, uh, anybody had been in the shop or if Hunter had been in the shop to collect it. I said no. He seemed kind of like a really kind of puzzled about it. Uh, that didn't ease my conscience either. Uh, but then that was it. That was the last I, I have known, knowingly communicated with the FBI. Um, uh, obviously when the impeachment trial occurred and I realized that the laptop wasn't ever going to make an appearance or anything, there was no mention of it. I, I had a, a bad feeling that the circle of people that knew about this was a lot larger than I thought. And they, they all knew what I knew, but they weren't telling the people that needed to know. So I was concerned even more. Yeah, thanks for taking me through all that. Um, just two clarity points. So the the subpoena, yeah, I was, I was wondering about that because it said something about the grand jury, but you weren't called before a grand jury. It was a subpoena for the, for the doctor, for the computer, not for your testimony. Right? Yeah, it said in lieu of testimony, see Appendix A or something. something and so that. you've never been called in by David Weiss or anybody like that to be interviewed? No, nope. interesting. Um, and then no, you said you had... I, I I, I want to uh, say something as well because once Go for it. Uh, once John Paul hired me, I reached out to the Delaware um, uh, Attorney General, uh, and where I was told the laptop was and stuff, and I introduced myself and I said, you know, if you need, if you have any questions or anything, uh, let me know. And I haven't heard anything from anyone since then. Interesting. Um, and John Paul, you said that you had uh, copies of, of the data. At what point did you make copies of, of the data? You mentioned you, you shared it with your father when he was talking with the FBI. So what point in this timeline here did you uh, make, make, a, make a copy of the data? Well, technically, the first copy was made uh, about uh, April 16th when Hunter dropped off the hard drive. So I made the copy and then put that on the shelf with the laptop, and that's where it sat. The the first time I made a copy for my own personal use was after I came back 
from speaking with my father about what we were going to do, we decided that we were going to make two copies of the laptop, a copy that I was going to mail to him so that he could take it to the FBI. And then a copy that I would give to a trusted friend should something happen to me. Like if, if my father went to the FBI and they throw him in prison and then they come after me, I needed to make sure that there was still a copy that was out there that could be used as leverage or who knows what. So I made two copies. I want to say it was about September 26th. Um, I made two copies. I put one copy in a manila envelope uh, with instructions uh, to- This is on an external hard drive? Yep. Yep. Uh, to give to actually, uh, to, at the time, the, the person that I identified as probably the most- uh, knowledgeable on the events in Ukraine and who was also a lawyer and who was also representing the president of the United States was Rudy Giuliani. So I figured, cause I'm not, I'm not very in, inept in politics. Um, or I, I am. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, <laughs> you're, you're not very apt. <laughs> yes. I'm not <laughs> apt in politics. Uh, so I didn't, you know, I just kind of Google things and figure out, okay, this looks like a lawyer. It looks like somebody who's been actively pursuing the, what I perceived as criminality on the laptop. Let me choose this guy. So I chose this Rudy. on the two original copies that you sent to your father and your friend? No, nope. nope. oh, this, this was, was the, the second guy. This, guy. this okay. was the, the copy that I gave to my friend in case something should happen to me. She was going to hand deliver it to gotcha. Rudy Giuliani. The other copy was actually put in a stuffed animal Garfield and then mailed to my mother. Um, so that's, uh, cause she likes the cloak and dagger thing, I think. So, uh, um, and so, okay. So you, um, you gave it to your friend to give to Giuliani at some point you actually did reach out to, or somehow made contact with Giuliani. So at what point was that? And how did you do that? So, uh, about mid August, I grew incredibly frustrated. Uh, I had sent my father and my uncle off to reach out to members of Congress in the white house to try to alert them to not only existence of the laptop, but also the FBI's handling of the laptop. And then, and, and the, the, what I was perceiving as a, a, co a cover up, and uh, that fell on deaf ears. And that lasted from through March through July of 2020 the effort, multiple efforts were made by both retired colonels in the air force to, to alert people to this. Uh, so finally I kind of felt like a clock was ticking Um and if I didn't do something and I, I kind of felt I felt like I needed to kind of trade my courage or my fear for courage. So I uh, I reached out to I went to actually Rudy Giuliani's law firm uh, website, the security Giuliani Securities something. And I just went to their uh, contact us section and I said, hey, look, I'm I'm sitting on something that I feel is very important and i needed i think that the fbi is not acting on it I, this is what i did and i i basically said this is what i've been through and i this needs to get to people that know what to do with it and that to have hold people accountable and, and seek justice for this mainly though to to get this out there so that i would not disappear and uh uh, that's when Bob Costello, who's a lawyer for Rudy Giuliani, reached back out to me. We had a phone call. Uh, I think it was just, he was just trying to make sure I was a real person and not BS. Uh, then I overnighted a, the actual copy that I gave to my friend is the copy that I eventually overnighted to Rudy Giuliani. So that remained in a manila envelope untouched for almost a year. And then, uh, yeah, overnighted on August 28th of, uh, 2020 and uh assisted bob in accessing the data for you know cuz old guys and computers and then um uh, don't tell him i said that uh, <laughs> and then um yeah it it's that was pretty much the end of my involvement i uh i and, I, and, uh, I, I, I wish that was I the wanna, end of my involvement and i want to interrupt here i think this is a good point to say that um john paul um, dealt with Bob Costello. He n did not deal at all with Giuliani. Uh, and in fact, uh, John Paul, you can correct me, you didn't even meet Giuliani until this past year when you were invited to some function um, mm -hmm. where you were, there was some function in New York City where both he and you were honored, were guests of honor. Uh, and that was the first time you even uh, met 
Giuliani. Yeah, I, actually, I was very adamant when I started talking to Bob that I didn't want anybody to know who I was, that I was I still consider myself a target. And I was very I had my business. I had my place in my community. I was clinging on desperately to hope that that was not going to disappear. And so I, I I told Bob that I didn't want anybody to know my name. So they just referred to me as Bob's guy. They even asked if they could give me a credit card to pay for the shipping. And I said, look, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't, I don't want to take anybody's credit card for fear of campaign finance violation charges or something crazy like that. So, you know, I was very adamant to try to even keep myself a secret from, from the people that were trying to help me. Just as a comparison, you know, with the FBI, it took several months from when you originally reached out to when they got the laptop. Um, how how quickly did Costello turn around and say, send this to me? Like once he got your email, how long was it before he actually asked for the laptop or the, the data? I think maybe 48 hours, maybe 72. Um, I mean, and then he went over, I sent him a couple emails initially. He was he was like, what's your concern about this? And I was like, here, here's this one email. And I, I would send him that email to, to verify and. And uh, so, you know, I, there was a little back and forth, but it, it it's uh, I think the fact that I had known I knew what I was talking about because of the, the research I had done. And I, I, I blame my, myself for Congress ignoring my father, and my uncle, because they I don't think they knew exactly what to describe. And and I, I feel like I, I could have done better on that, but I was afraid I was I thought I could get out of this with without losing my job or my business or you know having to run well that kind of gets into my next question which was what what was your reaction when the new york post article came out did you know that that was in process when that was in process i i so i want to say it was october 11th i was working in the shop it was a sunday Uh, i had the blinds closed lights are minimal uh because we're closed it's just a good time for me to get in there and and do some work and then there was a knock on the door and this woman with an iphone was standing out front so i i thought it was just a customer and then i opened the door and she's like are you john isaac or (laughs) she butchered my name and and i was like oh dear and then she was like i'm a, a reporter for the new york post i'm here to just verify that you're real uh bob costello told me about you and you know i i was my heart was beating out of my chest because the absolute last person I would ever want to talk to was the press. I didn't want to deal with the press at all. I wanted this to go to the authorities. So I, I, I was very anxious and tried to answer the questions the best I could. And she left and uh, I called Bob and was like, what the hell was that? And he's like, that's normal. You know, they're just making sure you're a real person. And then, uh, then I still didn't know when the article was coming out until uh, October 13th. I get a phone call about five minutes before closing uh, from George Maceres, who was representing Hunter Biden at the time. And he called me saying that uh, he goes, my client left the laptop with you sometime in 2017. Uh, do you still have it? And I said, uh, basically, I told him what the FBI told me to tell him. They told me that if anybody came looking for the laptop, say that it's in an offsite location, that you'll you need a day or two to retrieve it, collect their information. When you're done talking to them, immediately contact Agent Mike, and then they'll return the laptop so I can return it, which I always thought was odd because if it's evidence, how should it be so easily returned? So uh, I, that's exactly what I told uh, George Maceres. I said, hey, it's in an offsite location. Normally, we don't hold on to equipment that long. Um, I'll, you know, Shoot me an email with your contact information and your credentials so that you're allowed to represent the customer. And then I'll, give you, I'll call you back next day, uh, which he did. He sent me an email. And then I immediately called Bob Costello and said, uh, WTF, uh, you know, what I'm, I'm freaked out. And he was like, oh, that's normal. They... They call everybody before uh, a, a story is run. So George just probably got a, a phone call from the post. So he's just calling around. And I'm like, well, great. And I I then called an Uber and I went to a friend's house. I was so afraid I didn't go home that night. Um, and then the next day I I went to work and it was it was a hard day. Um I guess, yeah, what was 
the process like for you um, after that article finally came out? And I think, you know, your name wasn't mentioned in the article, but there were some documents in there that made it possible to assess who you were. What what happened next there? Yeah, I'm the only Mac shop in like a thousand miles and uh, definitely the only Apple repair business that's outside of Apple in Delaware. So it was uh, it, it didn't take long for people to figure it out. And uh, I started getting death threats by I think the article came out at like 630 in the morning. By like seven, I was getting people were were upset, and then uh, uh, luckily they didn't really. It was I'd say the press started showing up at the shop before angry customers, um, but they were very aggressive. Like I was still trying to trying to practice COVID rules, minimal people in the shop, and you know unlock the door, let somebody out, unlock the door, or you know let a new person in, and uh, so I was trying to keep the press out but they they busted their way in and then they they chewed me a new one for like an hour and then uh yeah and then then people started to come in that were upset and then people were coming in to let me know that they'll never do business with me again how could i and you know and well uh, also i want to say about the press coming in um you know it, it, you can actually listen to it on um i'm not sure if i already told you this uh casey but you can listen to it on the daily beast right. article about him and you you can hear them say that they're not leaving until he starts answering their questions and um and so at that time first of all he he has zero experience with the press um and they're threatening not to leave unless he answers their questions but he's also concerned about a lot of different things um including disclosing the identity of his father who had helped him and, and himself and his shop. So there was a lot going on. Um, and the press also, and I, I'm not sure uh, where they were all from. I know Daily Beast was there. CNN was there. I think CBS News was there. So there were quite a few people. And, um, you know, he was like a deer in headlights. And that's one thing people don't seem to understand is he's he's sitting there trying to answer questions to get them out of his shop but not give away names and and, and all the so it was a confusing time and um you know even just listening to that they're throw, they're putting words in his mouth about um Seth Rich and you can even hear him say who's that uh and they like, and they uh, explain to who it is. But then later on, I see in an article uh, that he even uh, talks about the conspiracy theory about Seth Rich, and which wasn't true. So it was there was a lot that happened at that time. You mentioned yeah. um, the, tough day. The CBS News in particular brought a, a question to mind for me, which was at some point, you know, outlets started reaching out to you directly for the data. And I believe CBS did an article where they said they were able to get a, a, a copy of the data so their forensic analysts could um, go over it. Um, so you had, I guess, a couple more copies somewhere, or was this something that the data was small enough it could be stored in like a Dropbox or something? I can I can take this uh, um, because um, so that after quite a while, I don't think CBS News got uh, the information uh, for a while, um, and until that happened, all of the data that was used was from the Giuliani drive. And um, it's my understanding, I, I wasn't there, but that Bob Costello, when he first got it, started creating folders in there to transfer important documents into. Um, so then it went to whoever, you know, I've heard Steve Bannon and all these different people. And so by the time it got to a lot of these other news organizations like the Washington Post um, and um, the New York Times. I got a call from, I think his name's Paul Hamburger, or the author of the Washington Post uh, article, saying that he had it and they were doing their own uh, search. And he was asking me about, you know, some of the contents that seemed to have been created after April 12th. And I told him that. I said, look, that's not a clean copy. That's been uh, in, I don't know how many different hands. But essentially, uh, people were talking about, uh, John Paul doesn't have the money to have a forensic analysis done. Uh, 
everyone was claiming, oh, well, since there are files there that were created after April 12th, then John Paul must be uh, working in cahoots with Giuliani and a liar and all. So um, Catherine Harridge from CBS News contacted me and she said, look, uh, I really want to do a, uh, a, a good look at this hard drive. And I believe John Paul uh, and, you know, I, I just really want to see if we can do our own analysis. So I reached out to a couple people that I knew just to uh, get a kind of a background on Catherine Harridge. And I, I heard great things about her as being pretty um, a pretty good reporter and uh, pretty even keeled. And um, so uh, I got back to her and I said, OK, uh, you, you know, uh, I will uh, get you the uh, the hard drive. Uh, so that you can do an analysis of it. And by th by this point, this hard drive was all over the place. Uh, right. So it was, it was, I just wanted someone to have a clean copy so that they could do a, an analysis. And John Paul, I think, didn't you just make a copy of the copy, uh, essentially? Well, what happened was uh, when, when you became my lawyer, and thank you very much for that, uh, you, <laughs> your first request was like, we have to get all the copies back. And really the only copy that, my was in my custody was still with my father it was the copy that i had mailed out so uh which my father had given that to my uncle just for safekeeping in case my father got raided so my uncle actually mailed you that drive and then you, from that drive that's the drive that basically has the creation date of september 26th of 2019 so that's the one that we've been cloning to give to cbs and whoever else that you requested. Had, had any of the congressional subcommittees reached out to you or asked for any information? Because I know there have been a few congressional investigations at the Hunter Biden. And I, wanted, I was curious if you've been uh, contacted all for that. So uh, it, it's like I reached out to, uh, like the first time I reached out to any members of Congress directly was back in September 25th of uh, 2020. Uh, when the uh, um, Grassley and Johnson released their Senate report. And I was reading through the report and I saw a lot of, uh, lot of money exchanging hands, but there was a lot of questions about what that money was used for. And I was like, wait a second, I think I can provide that. So I went to Ron Johnson's uh, website and I filled out their whistleblower link. And then I got in contact with them and explained the situation. Unfortunately, that turned into more of a, uh, uh, DNI and a uh, and NSA interrogation phone call where they just wanted to make sure I wasn't a Russian for about an hour and a half. So uh, I I really felt like that didn't go anywhere. So I was kind of reluctant to talk to anybody from Congress uh, up until I want to say it was March of twenty twenty two. When when did when did Jack Maxey want me to go to Switzerland? Brian. Oh yeah, I I don't even remember. Is that twenty one or was that that had to be twenty twenty two? I'm looking it up right now. Um, or maybe maybe it's twenty twenty one. Uh yeah, Jack reached out to me, um, to ask if John Paul and that was the first I'd ever even heard of him. I had no idea who he was. Um, he asked if John Paul wanted to go for a trip. Uh, to go on a trip to Switzerland uh, with him to study the contents of the laptop. And and that we, none of us have trusted anyone uh, dealing with any of this. So um, it was an emphatic no. I mean, I ran it by John Paul and he had the same reaction I did. Uh, no, we don't want to get involved in this stuff. Um, but then, uh, you know, when Jack Maxey started putting out information, some uh, saying that he discovered new information. That's when uh, we started making statements because, you know, we weren't sure if it was some sort of reverse op, uh, intelligence op, where they were trying to say that the the laptop information didn't exist uh, or was uh, was fraudulent, and we knew it wasn't. So we wanted to say there's no way that that additional information could have. Uh, been on that drive um, because of the way John Paul copied it. And uh, so 
we started responding to that. But then uh, at some point, Representative Daryl Issa, uh, his office um, reached out to us uh, as part. I can't remember which committee he's part of. One of the committees that was in, that's investigating, and they requested a, a clean copy of the drive. Um, so I can't remember if that was before CBS. I want to say it was before CBS. Um, so we provided his office, uh, the, that committee, with a clean copy of the drive. I think I've. But worked, that was it. I think. Yeah, I've worked more with members of Congress just to warn them when Maxi, because Maxi distributed five copies of his tainted drive to members of Congress, and so I, I personally reached out to those members of Congress just to say, throw it in the trash, whack it with a hammer, uh, you know, just get rid of it because it's 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 a trap. And uh, I, I got favorable responses, uh, but that was that was the extent of my direct communication with uh, these teams. Yeah, I think that covers everything that I wanted to cover. Was there any other points you wanted to make sure we touched on? Any other pieces of the timeline that uh, you think are important that we missed? Um, one of the things that I always talk about that I want to make sure is clear. John Paul was misquoted during that interview that the Daily Beast has on their website as saying that um, he could not identify the customer uh, and people attributed that to it because of his um, being legally blind. That's not the case. Uh, and I don't know if I already told you this, Casey, but John Paul just didn't know. He knew who Hunter Biden was, but he didn't know what he looked like. So when when Hunter Biden walked in, um, he was a customer, you know, John Paul was checking him in just like anyone else took his, asked for his name and he, he said Hunter and then asked for his last name and uh, Hunter seemed kind of taken aback by the way he reacted. He was like, um, Biden. And, um, and so at that point, John Paul didn't say, didn't think that it wasn't Hunter Biden. He had no reason to believe that it wasn't. Um, but he did verify after that by looking at pictures and saying, oh, yeah, that is that is the guy that I just saw. So it's not that he didn't he wasn't able to identify. He just at that moment when Hunter walked into the shop, he didn't know who it was. He didn't know. You know, he, I don't think, John Paul, you follow the Bidens that cl closely. <laughs> right. Okay. And presumably there were also emails and things like that afterwards where it was pretty obvious who you were dealing with well, as well. Well. The guy starring in a lot of the homemade movies sure sounded like the guy that was in my shop. Hunter's got a very distinctive kind of entitled high pitched voice. So it's 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 easy to 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 recognize. 